Also, it has as, had access to 1,000-pound bombs, SNEB rockets, 18-round matropods, and, of course, the Sura rockets, the later versions of the Hunter. I'm pretty sure the F-6 did not mount uh, air-to-air -air missiles, but uh, there was foreign operators which did modify the F-6 to include AAM capabilities or anti-air missiles with the help of AIM-9 Sidewinders. So if Gajin wanted to add this in the game with Sidewinders, they could, but they would just have to specify that it was one of the export versions of the Hunter F-6 and not the Hunter F-6 itself. This could easily be a great standard tech tree plane and also on top of it, a uh, premium uh, plane in the form of like the Votor where they gave that air to air missiles and not the one in the tree. I would prefer them not to do it, but if we see it, the historical precedent uh, it's definitely there there was also a ground attack version the fj9 and a photo reconnaissance version the fr10 and you know uh, they could definitely uh, put them in game as well maybe not the photo reconnaissance one but the ground to uh, air. one of the frequently asked questions about the f6 because at the time obviously you know air to air missiles were prevalent and or at least you know through its lifetime i should say uh, not really starting at the beginning but you know there, there was definitely times where the RAF could have added air-to-air -air missiles to this machine and the question is why didn't they well uh, the reason is is because at the time they were working on uh, establishing the English electric lightning you know uh, the one that we looked at last uh, last month the uh, lightning I believe it was the F2 uh, that got Mac, uh, passed on to developers, but that machine could go, you know, 2.2 Mac. That was seen as going to be the main fighter that Britain was going to use going forward. So therefore, why not put a lot of development time into that instead of a machine that is eventually going to be uh, phased out? So that's why, you know, the development of air-to-air -air missiles on the Hunter F6 never really happened apart from export models, which is a shame, you know, uh, because obviously in game, uh, missiles are going to become more and more of a prevalent thing and machines like the F-6 are going to suffer really hard from not having them unless, you know, as I said, they want to put in the one which has uh, the, uh, you know, the export versions which the Sidewinders. The next uh, one is from Kiri and uh, they are talking about the F-86D for Japan. Now, we've already talked about the F-86D. Uh, over here, uh, when we come to the F-86K, which was obviously developed off the F-86D, but the Japanese version is a little bit different. What is the difference between the Japanese version and the US version, you may ask? Well, of course, the Japanese version doesn't have guns. Uh, <laughs> instead, it just has some rocket armament. So it has either 24 Mighty Mouse FFRs, uh, Mark IVs or Mark XIs, uh, or Mark 40 70 millimeter rockets placed in a ventral tray. So this machine has no armament on it apart from rockets. And obviously, uh, <laughs> with a machine like this, uh, you know, it doesn't have any missiles or bombs. It's literally just rockets. So if you wanted to add this to the Japanese tree, you would be severely hindering yourself uh, when it comes to what you can be used for. Uh, but the main thing is, uh, you could still, uh, you know, add it into game. It does have heat rockets on it. It could be used in a sense for, you know, ground forces or ground realistic or, you know, killing vehicles in uh, realistic. It also has a really interesting gun pod in the center. It reminds me of the one which is on the, is it the Super Mysterian game? Where it actually comes out of the center, well, not the center of the fuselage, but near the center of the fuselage. And it kind of pops down and then you fire stuff. It looks like an exact same system to that so uh, my I, I would love to see the gecko in game just because uh, it's it would be the first useless saber that we have uh, being added and uh, since you know the Japanese have some great sabers why not throw one in which is a little bit more fun uh, which is a little bit more interesting uh, such as the gecko the now this one from Arado Akbar, uh, <laughs> is uh, talking about, of course, the very early Japanese guided missiles. Now, I've talked a lot with people, especially people like Switzerland, about stuff like Japanese guided air-to-surface missiles. They seem to have developed some during World War II, and this 
uh, here. The pass to development uh, suggestion is talking about the key 147 and the key 148. Now these are, uh, if, right, we're, we're going to, right, I'm going to preface this because I have to do this with all of the Japanese super tech that was, you know, created. So let's preface and then let's talk about what is supposed to have happened. So the key 147 and the key 148, the main difference between them is the uh, size and what's loaded into them. So uh, if we uh, have a look, I just want to make sure I'm right about this. Here we go. The key 147 was significantly larger than its brother, bearing a Navy type number 80, 800 kilogram bomb as the warhead and then the key 148 uh, was equipped with a 300 kilo heat charge so that is the difference between them the flight characteristics and the general way they work is exactly the same they were powered by the mitsubishi's toku ro mark one liquid fuel rocket motor it was the uh, propulsion system as i said and it also had the sumitomo communicating machine company built the radio uh, control systems so basically uh, the preface is after world war ii the uh, the u.s forces which were sent to occupy japan found that the approximately 200 missiles that were supposed to have been i definitely put in quotations supposed to have been built all destroyed all of the testing data annihilated and the only way we know about this stuff is from uh, questions to you know japanese higher-ups and what was actually going on and obviously the pictures that we see here uh, so just understand when it comes to a lot of this <laughs> late war stuff in japan it's very hard to tell what is true it's very hard to tell exactly how stuff works we only have a few people's word on how these things went so you know take everything with a pinch of salt but if this is true technically these are some of the first guided missiles that will have ever existed now people uh, compare them to the fritz x the difference between the fritz x and these is that these have a propulsion system the fritz x, the fritz x doesn't the fritz x has a flare on it uh, making it look like you know it has a propulsion system but that's so just to guide the bomb in so these are actually much more advanced than uh, the fritz x these are uh, a technical missile you know one of the first of its kind and the basic way i can see it controlling a more thunder would have been very similar as real life you know you let go of it and then you control it like you would one of the nord missiles or one of the missiles from something like the Rakuten, uh, you know, the Rakuten Yagpanzer, where you use the keyboard to control this and into the target. So this would be one of the earliest ground-to-surface missiles we've seen. Now, uh, according to uh, this post here, uh, the Egos uh, had their first prototype in October 1944. They were tested all the way through until 1945, and then they were never actually used against uh, anything in combat because they were seen as twofold or had twofold issues so the key 67 was used uh, to uh, transport the key 147 you know the larger bomb and then the type 99 light bomber uh, the key 482 and the key 102 otsu were going to carry the smaller bomb the two main issues uh, which meant that these were never used in combat the first of all uh, the first one it was seen that the uh, bombers which were carrying these would be way too vulnerable to attacks meaning that they would never actually get to their target on time therefore it would be useless using them uh, the second one is that they wanted to keep them uh, for further testing uh, to make sure to get it right because according to them they achieved a 75 percent accuracy uh, which is you know quite impressive uh, especially from a new concept and also on top of it uh, they wanted to keep them for the defense of mainland japan so you see this you know narrative with a lot of the japanese weapons and you can kind of understand this uh, but the main thing is uh, it's just it's another case of those look at this cool thing japan made oh no we have no physical evidence for it apart from some pictures and uh, even these, you know, these pictures are not of them firing. They're just them of moving them about. But, you know, you've, you've got to you've got to hope that it's real because this is a really cool story. And I just hope that, you know, at some point we can get a lot of this stuff proved, uh, especially these statistics which are thrown about. And uh, it would have been nice to see it used in combat. 
uh, just to show its uh, actual prowess, but unfortunately, that's uh, never happened. So, uh, let's move on to the next one. This is the uh, Caproni CA204. Before, and this is done by Satoru Anabuki, and this is uh, the a plane which actually lost out to the Kant Z1014 uh, in the uh, public competition for the BGR, the Bombardier Grand uh, Reggio, or the Long Range Bomber competition. This came second uh, in the competition, the Caproni CA204. And it lost to the Kant Z1014 and the Piaggio P108B. Now, what's surprising is they built 1014s and 108Bs, but never built the Caproni CA204. So this never existed. Therefore, it is off my list, therefore I'm not interested in it, but it is at least something that people look for, uh, you know, as a machine to be added to the game. I don't like paper designs, this is a paper design. The last one, uh, but not least, uh, for a lot of people, is the Sepcat Jaguar, once again from P Vorpiev. Now, the Sepcat Jaguar is a joint project between Britain and France for uh, a, well, it started off as a way for both, uh, both nations to get themselves their hands on a trainer. What they actually wanted to do was create a new and fangled jet trainer, but instead came out of a uh, the co cooperation with a lot better machine than they had envisioned. This meant that generally, you know, they were very happy uh, with the Sepcat Jaguar and the work that they did together on it. And the only issue was that they actually had a separate, you know, kind of funding scheme for a proper professional uh, fighter that they also wanted to do. And France, uh, well, screwed over uh, basically a lot of stuff. So what France did was they took uh, the money that was supposed to go into that pot and funded it into an independent venture and then said that the uh, dependent venture, which we, was also on Britain, they didn't have the money for. So they kind of screwed Britain in that regard, but out of it, at least we got the Sepacats. Now, the Sepacats is what I would class as a ground attacker. This is not a fully fledged uh, fighter uh, jet. It's not a fully fledged air to air machine. It is definitely at least uh, a multi role machine. And one of the big things that it doesn't have, uh, which would be a massive disadvantage compared to other aircraft, is the fact it doesn't have any radar. You know, uh, all it has uh, on board is access to air to airs, air to grounds, and of course some defers, because everything <laughs> from about the 50s and onwards uh, for uh, most European countries has the defers, which are wonderful. You know, the fast firing 30 millimeters. Everyone always comments on the Sepakat Jaguar's design. Uh, being a strike fighter, it is an absolutely beautiful machine. Uh, it would be, it would look uh, like one of the most modern aircraft we have in game. You know how we have like the Mitsubishi T2, right? Uh, where it just looks clean. It looks like a modern day jets. Well, the Sepa Cat would be exactly the same in that regard. Very slim, very angled, very beautiful. And uh, at least for this suggestion, it's seen as only being used for the French. I think there is also a call for it to be used uh, for the British. I personally would... I don't like copycat vehicles, so... If there was a difference between them, you know, maybe the different secondary armaments that they have, yeah, okay, fair enough, you know, we can add them in, but the main thing is, you know, it's, uh, it shouldn't be, uh, it shouldn't just be a copycat vehicle across the nations. You can see the, uh, 30 millimeters, you can see the different uh, loads it can carry. But uh, if we go down, uh, you can see the different armaments. So you have two 30 millimeter DEFA cannons, uh, 300 rounds in total, five hard points, a uh, capacity of 10,000 pounds, and provisions to carry combinations of eight Matra rocket pods, 18 SNEB uh, 68 millimeter rockets each. Then it had anti radar missiles, uh, laser guided air to ground missiles, which for me is like the next step, right? I think what we're going to get is like an A10 Warthog with its Mavericks or something. And then, you know, we'll work out how good laser <laughs> guided munitions stuff is. Then we have magic air to air missiles and under wing pylons. Then we got bombs, various guided or unguided, uh, laser guided bombs. And then, of course, nuclear bombs just to screw everything up. It also had stuff like ECM protection, reconnaissance pods, uh, laser electro optical targeting pods, external drop tanks, all, you know, basically everything.
you know, uh, you, you're pretty much looking at uh, it can carry everything of the era. It was also used in the 1990s in the Persian Gulf War. Uh, the issue with it was, as I said, though, is that it didn't have radar. So they had to use it in combined with the Dassault Mirages, uh, the reconnaissance aircraft, to guide in the uh, Sepakat Jaguars, uh, which I think is, you know, pretty cool. The main thing that people point to, uh, when they talk about this machine, is its speed. Uh, the speed of this at maximum is 1.6 uh, of a, you know, a maximum speed. Now, the reason why a lot of people bring this up is because it's a very similar speed to the T2 that we have in game. Now, the, it is very simple finding a counter for the, the T2, but I don't think this is it. And the reason why is because the Sepcat Jaguar is not fully designed to be an air combat fighter. It is, first of all, designed to be a training fighter, very much similar to the T2, right? But on top of it, it is also designed as one of these multi-role vehicles, where it's designed to annihilate point A over there, and then afterwards or before may be able to fight other aircraft. But if it comes up against pure actual fighters which is what we're going to be seeing coming out of america and also the soviets you know when the serpent is added all i can see is this thing just getting ass blasted out over there somewhere to absolute hell uh, which is the the obviously the issue with it right you know if 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 you're gonna pick in war thunder especially in air realistic what do you want do you want a multi-role aircraft do you want a strike fighter do you want just a fighter fighter? You're always going to pick the fighter fighter. So even though this may be added to the game, and, you know, it's a very similar speed to the T2, think about what could come after after it. You know, the MiG-21, uh, even stuff like the F-104 Starfighter. It's You've got to think about these things, otherwise the Jaguar will be bin and gone before it's even started. It'll get its updates, and it'll be great in one update, and then it will just fade into obscurity, until they add stuff like laser guided munitions should they add this hell yes of course they should should we temper expectations of course as well <laughs> because uh, you know i'm always wary of strike fighters in general anyway uh, those were the stuff that was passed on to development obviously a lot of post-war stuff but you know there's still hopes uh, for the world war ii things you know uh, more agms uh, you know air to ground missiles uh, from the japanese then of course a rocket propelled piston engine uh, which exploded only twice so don't you know don't don't think about that you know don't think about that but a lot of sabers a lot of american stuff here uh, which is completely fine uh, because obviously america being the world hegemon for the last well let's say 50 years it's not a surprise that a lot of stuff is based off american technology anyway once again uh, thank you to everyone for creating these articles. Thank you to Cokesbury for putting them together. And next time, we'll have a look at those ground forces. I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time. I'd just like to thank B. Young, Blackie, Daniel Stanton, Dyslexic Child, Martinez, Matati, Moxie, Nito, Nick Graham, Alobrolo, and Super Cacti for supporting me on Patreon.